In this section I will be talking about scaling and dynamic similarity and I just want to mention I am here looking um, following Bachelor's book more closely Bachelor and that is from page 211 onward so for um, a couple of lectures ago we derived the Navier-Stokes equation and let me just write it out here briefly And we will, for in this section, ignore uh, the effect of gravity or an external field. And you can really do that for a number of, of fluid mechanics classic problems and questions. So the question that we're going to address in this section is, for a given flow, how important are the individual terms? So we could say roughly, oh, if we have, for example, large velocities and a small viscosity, then the viscous term, the last term here, becomes negligible, and we can write this simply as du dt. equals minus grad p over rho, which is nothing else but the Euler equation. And what I should add here for completeness is we're assuming in this whole section that our density rho and our viscosity mu are constants. That is, Euler equation is one extreme limit, right, where viscosity terms become negligible. And then we have Another limit, which is where we have small velocities and large viscosity. And in that case, you can really ignore the acceleration term here on the left-hand side. And then you're just left with 0 equals. And this is what's known as Stokes flow. And let's note, you can see, um, this only depends linearly on u, because the nonlinear term, the advection term up here, uh, disappeared. So this is actually, Stokes flow is linear. Now, this whole treatment is rather vague and there's a lot of cases where um, the balance between the inertial term and the viscous term is a little more subtle so we want to do a little better than just have this very vague description here now before I move on let me just mention that the pressure term the pressure gradient term Grab P is typically a passive term um, that is essentially determined by the balance of the other two, of the viscous and the inertial term. So really what we're interested in is the balance of the density term rho and the viscosity term mu. So if we change the density of the flow, or the viscosity, how does the flow of our fluid change? And in order to answer that, we will rewrite our equation in dimensionless terms. Basically that means we don't, we're not really going to care what units we're going to use for rho or mu. We just want to know how the flow changes for the relative magnitude of these two terms. So the nice thing here is that we can write any physics equation in dimensionless terms. So, for example, 
We don't care in that case whether my pressure is given in pounds per square inch or in pascal or whatever insane unit you want to think of. Yeah, so we don't care about the units, we just care about the relative magnitudes. So we will define the following non-dimensional uh, variables. Ui dash, and I'm using index notation here for now, is Ui divided by a velocity scale u. Xi dash is divided by Xi, Xi divided by some length L. So then the unit of Ui is just 1, and the units of Xi, sorry, Ui dash and Xi dash is 1. And then a little more complicated to get a dimensionless time, we divide T by L over U. And then you will see the unit of T dash, namely, is seconds, T, divided by meters, L, divided by meters per second, which is also 1. Now, let me just copy the equation over here. What you find is in the equation itself, there are no length or velocity parameters here. So there's no typical length or typical velocity already given in the Navier-Stokes equation. If we had that, we could use those inbuilt velocity or length parameters to define to um, define our l or our u. But since we don't have those, um, we have to find the inbuilt velocity or length scales from the setup of the question. So typically you instead invoke the boundary conditions or the geometry of the system. So, for example, you have flow in a tube with diameter L. Then that is what you want to use to non-dimensionalize your distances. Uh, you might have a background velocity u infinity, and so you would use that as your u to non-dimensionalize your velocity. And the final thing that we need to non-dimensionalize here is p. So p is typically um, rescaled by saying it's p minus some background pressure, p infinity, and then divided by rho u squared. So let's just check that this is really non-dimensional. Sorry, this is obviously p dash. p dash would be the units um, is force of area, right? That's your pressure unit for p. And then the units of 1 over rho u squared, which is, so force, kilogram meter per second squared over area meter squared, so this is kilogram meters per second squared meter squared, and then 1 over rho, so that would be meter cubed over kilogram, and then 1 over u squared, which is second squared over meter squared. And you can see the kilograms cancel, the seconds cancel, and the meters cancel as well. So this is just one. Okay, so if we start from our Navier-Stokes equation up here,
and carry out this non-dimensionalization, then we end up with rho u squared over l du dash dt and I'll go um, use vector notation here and I use index notation here du dash dt dash plus u squared l u dash grad dash u dash is minus rho u squared over l grad dash p dash grad dash p dash plus mu u over l squared grad dash squared u. And so you see there is a row u squared of l term for all three of these terms and something quite similar here. So let's divide the whole equation by rho u squared over l. And then you will get on the left hand side, I can combine these again and it's the material derivative, so it's just du dt dash equals minus grad dash p dash plus mu over rho l u del square dash u dash and now we define this parameter here which is a non-dimensional parameter right all terms are now non-dimensional this parameter here is 1 over the Reynolds number, 1 over Re. Re is the Reynolds number, and it is defined to be rho L u over mu. And so we write our equation, our Navier-Stokes equation, non-dimensionless, is du dt equals minus grad p plus 1 over re del squared u dash. And now, what does that mean? What, what does re, what does the Reynolds number represent, really? So if we look back to our dimensional form of this equation, um, and we say that the balance really is between the inertial and the viscous term and the pressure term is passive. And we write the ratio of these two terms. Dimensionally, it would be rho du dt divided by mu rad squared u. So this is my inertial term. Then that is the same as re du dash dt dash divided by grad squared dash u. Um, since this is how the Reynolds number drops out when we non-dimensionalize. And now if we've rescaled everything appropriately, then this term here is approximately 1. 
and so is this term. Yeah, that's the whole idea of making this non-dimensional, is that you say, hey, let's rescale everything so that it's approximately unity apart from the one parameter of in and we're interested in the value of this parameter so we're interested in flows that have high Reynolds numbers or low Reynolds numbers for a given Reynolds number everything else is roughly the same and so if these two terms here up here are roughly unity then also is this so the best interpretation for the Reynolds number really is that it is the ratio of the inertial term, the inertial forces versus the viscous forces. So as a couple of examples, yeah, larger Reynolds numbers are inertial flows or inertial processes. So that would be, for example, a person swimming has Reynolds number roughly 10 to the 6. Uh, pitch, a pitch in baseball has Reynolds number 10 to the 5. A blue whale swimming has a really large Reynolds number 10 to the 8. And since the Reynolds number is rho L u over mu, you can see because the blue whale has a large L and uh, they go fairly fast. A small fish on the other side has a Reynolds number of 10 to the 1. So that's kind of intermediate. Um, and then flows with low Reynolds numbers, small Reynolds numbers, are things like lava, paint, or bacteria in mucus. They all have Reynolds number of roughly 10 to the minus 1.